You know those days where you throw a party and you're wondering if people will show up? And then they all do. <laughs> it's kind of like that moment. So I'm Abby Kearns and I'm with Pivotal and diversity and diversity in technology and diversity in open source communities is really important to me. And Sam gave me the opportunity to turn this event into something a little bit more. And I'm so excited that everyone showed up. We have an amazing agenda for today. We're going to start off with Robin Hauser Reynolds, the filmmaker behind the new documentary, Code Debugging the Gender Gap. Wow. And then we're going to turn that into a panel, which I am going to host and moderate on diversity in the open source community. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask a few questions of the panelists, but then I really want to open it up to the room. So be thinking about questions that you can ask. We're going to have microphones running around to really make this an interactive conversation with the panelists and with Robin on how we can really sponsor more diversity and really, as Sam talked a lot about this morning, turn this into a listening culture. So with that, Robin, I'm going to hand this off to you to start your piece. Thank you so much. Thanks um, to Cloud Foundry and to Pivotal and Pivotal Labs uh, for having me here. First thing I want to say is that um, I am not a, a, a woman in tech. I'm a filmmaker. And um, we would not have been able to make this film if it weren't for all of you. So um, I just want to also point out Stacey Hartman, producer, is here with us today. In the spring of 2013, my daughter was in college and she called home. She was studying computer science and she started to express some doubts about her ability to actually major in the subject. She said, Mom, they're all men in the class. There's only one other girl. They know so much more than I do about it, even in these prerequisite classes. She goes, I think I'm failing. When in fact, uh, she was getting a B. And after about four classes, she did in fact drop out. At the same time, though, there were these international newspapers that were coming out that were talk, saying things like this, you know, sorry grads, if you don't have a computer science degree or at least some knowledge of computer science, good luck getting a job. And I was fascinated by the fact that there seemed to be so many jobs, lucrative jobs, and yet it looked like it was really difficult for young women to be studying this in college. So then the White House issued a report that said by 2020, there would be 1.4 million computer science jobs in the US alone, and only 400,000 computer scientists graduating. So that's 1 million unfilled jobs. That's five years from now. So why is this supply and demand so skewed? Well, it turns out we're missing half the population. This is an incredible room of very talented tech women. But as you probably very well know, we're missing people of color and women in the industry. If you look carefully at some of these um, companies, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Apple, the highest one, which is Apple, is 20% women. If you want to look at people of color, it's, it's even worse. Latinos hold less than 8% of tech jobs, and blacks less than 7%. So the face of tech is really sort of this, your average white male. One of my favorite quotes is by, from Gloria Steinem, who says that women have always been an equal part of the past, just not an equal part of history. And I think this is absolutely especially true in the history of computing. Women pioneers in early computing have all been forgotten from history. I mean, how many people in this room, but to most audiences, most people don't know who Ada Lovelace was. Ada Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter, and she worked with Charles Babbage on the analytical machine. Ada Lovelace was a mathematician who wrote a first and very important description of Babbage's analytical engine. She's often considered to be the first computer programmer. You probably have heard of, you probably all know, Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper invented the first compiler that was designed for the 
uh, pro first programming language. She and, her, she and her team also coined the term debugged. She was working on one of her early machines and found this moth. And in her lab notebooks from this period, we have uh, this description of the very first computer bug, and it's taped right into the, the notebook. And, and debugging, of course, is one of the things that's so hard about programming. These are little uh, clips from the film. So interestingly enough, in 1984, there were more women in the field than there are now. Um, and I think the real question is, why is it so important that we have women and diversity um, at the coding level? And sometimes I think one of some of the best ways to talk about that is to show some of the blunders and some of the problems that have happened when there have not, haven't been women at the table. My favorite example, of course, is the airbag. The airbag was um, the first airbag that came out actually killed women and children. And the reason for that is because it was designed to fit the specs of the average engineer on the team. And that person was a 30-something-year-old white male. When voice activation was first um, engineered, it was tested with male voices. And therefore, women's voices couldn't be heard. And it failed there in navigation systems and cars and elsewhere. And then when video tracking was aligned with voice activation, women couldn't be seen. That's just one of my favorite graphics from the film, so I had to show it to you. <laughs> so greater diversity really leads to greater innovation. Products that serve greater breadth of humanity. This is one of my favorite examples. Buscando was made by a group of Latina women for Central American refugee children. And the idea is that it's an app that connects refugees with social services so to provide food, clothing, shelter, and host families to a lot of the Latin American children that were coming across the border. An app like this, it's hard to think that this might have been thought up of if you were just with a homogeneous group of coders in Palo Alto, right? So this is the type of app that's, that's coming out that's really helping people. Um, but it would take someone to know that there was that need on the team. One of my favorite things to talk about when we talk about the importance of having women on, um, on a team is something that's called the female factor. Some of you might know this. It was published actually in the Harvard Business Review in 2011. And what it states is that regardless of the individual IQs of people on a team, the collective IQ of the group increases when you add a woman. And the more women on the team, the higher the collective IQ. So basically, a group with more women is going to be smarter than a group of all men, regardless of individual IQs. So this is a room full of women primarily. I know that you get that with me. I'm just saying it's, it's actually documented. I think it's fascinating. So what's going on? Why aren't there more women? and people of color in computer science engineering. We have found that the biggest culprit is stereotype and mindsets. This is Jocelyn Gold, uh, sorry, um, Jocelyn Goldfein from Facebook, formerly. She's a senior um, VP of engineering, and this is what she has to say on the matter. Women don't enter computer science because they look at it and they see that there's so few women there, and it is surrounded with so many stereotypes and so much messaging that this is a place for men, that this is not a place for women, that this is not a field for women. Um, and I think that that sort of, that set of beliefs is not sort of superficial. Um, I think it starts very, very young. It starts with the books that we read our children. When I open Curious George and every scientist and doctor is a man, when the only female characters are nurses and, and moms, which are wonderful professions, but do not represent the full spectrum of all the things women can do. Um, it sends a very one-sided message that this is a set of things that men are good at and women are not good at. And, um, and I think children internalize those beliefs early and children want to conform. Then there's also the myth of the boy genius. The myth that you have to be antisocial, nerdy, wear glasses, hoodies, want to stay up all night and be in your basement drinking Red Bull and eating stale pizza. <laughs> Debbie Sterling from Goldie Blocks said some interesting things about this. 
Well, I think that engineering has a marketing problem. I think that uh, well, growing up as a little girl, I certainly wasn't interested in it. I pictured engineers as nerdy guys who have no friends, who sit alone all day, grokking on algorithms, who are geniuses. And I think um, it's, it's incredibly intimidating, especially for a girl who doesn't see other women in the field. And frankly, there just are few women. Girls don't want to be the smart girl. Some of the research that we've um, discovered and well, we've, that we've been learning about and people that we've talked to talk about how in seventh and eighth grade, girls stop raising their hands. They don't want to be the smart girl. They want to be the cute girl. They want to be the popular girl. And something about our culture is telling them that it's not OK to be the smart girl. I think part of the culprit here is pop culture. It's Hollywood. It's a lot of the messages, as, as Jocelyn said in our books. But here's an interesting scene that sort of personifies this. On October 3rd, he asked me what day it was. It's October 3rd. Two weeks later, we spoke again. It's raining. Yeah. But I wanted things to move faster, so I followed my instincts. Hey, um, I'm totally lost. Can you help me? But I wasn't lost. Yeah. I knew exactly what Ms. Norbury was talking about. It's a factorial, so you multiply each one by N. Wrong. Is that the summation? Yeah, they're the same thing. Wrong. He was so wrong. Thanks. I, uh, I get it now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, is, is education the answer? Do we need to start... Um, incorporating computer science into schools. And I will tell you that from our research, yes, absolutely. Um, making computer science mandatory in the schools and even introducing it early on in elementary school with some of these amazing um, programs that are coming out like Codable and you saw Goldie Blocks, Little Bits, different things that kids can play with that are gender neutral. Um, I think is a real start to building the, the foundation of understanding the logic behind coding. Um, but it's, it's difficult to get this into the school, and of course there's resistance from a lot of educators. Um, where do they fit it in? Is it a, is it a math? Is it a language? Is it, um, is it a science? And the question that we hear from, and really the answer, the best answer that we've gotten from Megan Smith in the White House, who now, as you all know, is the CTO of the United States, um, and a wonderful role model, is that it actually should really should be incorporated into all different classrooms. It can be used to analyze data sets in, in science class. Um, it can be part of mathematics. But it really needs to be incorporated into all aspects of the curriculum, the same way it's integrated into all aspects of our life, whether it's in our pockets with our cell phone, whether it's in our navigation system in our car or in the hospitals. Um, Krista Marks is on the board of NC Wit, and she um, speaks a little bit to this. A broader issue, I think, which is that computer science is not in the schools. Uh, and I think that if it was done well and part of the curriculum, and by that I don't mean becoming comfortable with technology, I mean really creating technology, innovating, giving them the tools that they actually uh, can create things that are meaningful and relevant to their lives, I actually think that would increase math interest, right? Because there's, you sort of, those all become a little more interesting, a little cooler. So I think a sort of broad based national curriculum around computer science could have these other really positive effects. I'll just do that just so that she doesn't get mad at me with that last <laughs> frame that's holding up there. I think that um, getting into the schools is, is enormously um, important. And um, you know, hopefully, there will be a, a move in, in that direction. I will tell you that we've been really fortunate in that, so far, the documentary that premiered in Tribeca has attracted the attention of some of um, some of our government officials, um, people that are trying to get this into schools. And we have an amazing opportunity to actually screen the documentary um, for the State Department in DC, also um, on Capitol Hill for Congress, and in Geneva at the UN. So hopefully this will help spark the. <laughs> so if you can make it beyond the stereotypes and over the hurdles of the education system, and into the workplace, you then have to face another challenge, which you all know better than I do, which is dealing with startup culture and the misogynistic behavior that, that goes on there. 
Julianne Horvath, you might all recognize from GitHub. This is what she has to say about it. Our startups benefit from protecting their tribe. And if you, if you declare yourself an outsider of that tribe, the smartest thing for them to do from a business perspective is to get rid of you. But women are kind of born into that. Like we don't have an option of being the, the, the cultural other in that situation, same thing with minorities. There, a lot of sexism and racism in tech is actually blatant. It's not malicious, but it's from, a, it's from those actions and those things being pot, like reinforced with their own success and with money. So what can we do? In our view, there are several things that need to happen. We need to change mindsets. So we need to change the stereotype of a coder. The best way to do this is to have more female role models and more people of color. Having Megan Smith in the White House is a start. It's wonderful to have a woman. We need more women role models. Uh, Tracy Chow has been fabulous, you know her from, from Pinterest. There are role models in this room. We really need people to um, step out and, and have their voice heard and their faces seen so that people and pe children and people of color can see somebody in the industry that looks like them. We also need to make man school, CS mandatory in schools. We've already discussed that. That takes a while. We're behind. The United States is, is really behind in this way. Even the, U the UK just said that they will, are now making it obligatory in all schools, starting I think in two or three years. Um, interestingly enough, Cuba per capita graduates more computer science majors than we do. There are quite a number of countries that are ahead of us in this way. And then we need to disrupt startup culture. This is a clip from uh, a film that is, came out fairly recently, um, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And I think that this is, it's a start, right? It's one way that's showing that, okay, Hollywood can try to change the perception um, that a woman who is smart um, and interested in sciences can actually be cool. So, Jello. Right, right, right. It's a solid, it's a liquid, it's a viscoelastic polymer made of polypeptide chains. Would you eat it? I mean... It tastes good. <laughs> Why do you do that? Do what? Say something super smart and then bail from it. When I was a little girl, I wore a ponytail, I had glasses, and I was totally obsessed with the science of weather. Other girls wanted a Barbie. I wanted a Doppler Weather Radar 2000 Turbo. And I still need these glasses, but I never wear them. I bet you look great with glasses on. Oh, I'm really and high. And on they go. Whoa. Whoa. What? Nothing. Wait. Is the jello scrunchy? And now, the reveal. Wow. I mean, you were okay before, but now you're beautiful. Of course, interesting that the stereotype still has to have glasses. I don't know why that is, but. <laughs> um, so now I'm gonna play with you, uh, play for you rather, um, our trailer for the actual film. A lot of what you've seen today is not in the film. These are just some outtakes and things that I think um, are interesting perspectives on it. But, um, the film is on the film festival circuit, so right now we're just having private screenings to certain companies in certain places, um, and we'll be coming to the Bay Area in October. Um, we just premiered at Tribeca, and then we are um, on our way to AFI, which is in Washington, D.C., which is exciting for us to get exposure there. Um, and we'll let you know, keep an eye on our, on our website, and you'll be able to tell it's codedocumentary.com and you can see where other screenings are as they pop up. There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing related fields. Less than 29% of them are gonna be filled by Americans and less than 3% of that 29% are gonna be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman in tech. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 
it's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. Women with the Pioneer programmers, they've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, <laughs> coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us being consumers, we could be like a producer. In the same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, it's the boys that are good at science and it's the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution, to truly be great. It can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Code. Debugging the gender gap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. That was uh, an amazing introduction to the conversation we're going to have here today. I don't know if I can add anything else onto that other than color commentary, but I did want to bring up our panelists for today and really open it up for the conversation around diversity and particularly at here at Cloud Foundry Summit, diversity in an open source software community. So our first panelist is Cornelia Davis from Pivotal. She's the Director of Platform Engineering at Pivotal. Uh, second panelist is Malini Bandaru from Intel. <laughs> the Architect and Engineering Manager with the Open Source Technology Center at Intel. Cheryl Chamberlain from Capgemini. <laughs> She's the Group VP and Global Partner Executive and I made amazing time from SFO. Uh, I just got here. <laughs> Eileen Evans from HP. <laughs> Vice President and Deputy General Counsel of Cloud Computing and Open Source. And then finally, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel Reinitz from IBM. Distinguished engineer, as well as CTO of the Bluemix Garage. And uh, Robin, I don't know if you want to come back up as well. Robin's going to sit up here and be our sixth panelist and also be available to answer questions about the documentary. I don't want to take up too, my, too much time with an introduction, but I did want to tie a lot of what you talked about, Robin, as well as what um, Sam talked a lot about in his keynote this morning. Continuous innovation is the key to Cloud Foundry, the community, the platform, and what we all want to hope to accomplish with the platform in the future. And as Robin really hit home with the metrics and the data points, the only way to do that is through a diversity in the community. We're only going to achieve that excellence and that acceleration if our community is diverse and is listening to all the voices equally. And with that, I really want to open it up to the panelists and then eventually to the room to really talk about that and what does that mean? How do we become more diverse? How do we really enable a diverse participation in the community that right now, and it's been pointed out, we are minorities. 
And how do we really take that and turn that into a, a bigger momentum and a bigger foothold in a community that really needs the level of diversity that we can bring? So I want to start with kind of a, a generic question a little bit, but I really liked some of the points that Robin hit on, is what does diversity look like? And what is that, what are we, what are we going to say when we're diverse? And what is that, how, do, how does that manufacture itself in an open source community? And I'll open it up to the panelists. Everybody's stumped. <laughs> no one's polite. Yes. So, <laughs> that's, that, a, that's that, a women's that too. way for Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, I, I don't have the answer, um, and I don't think that there are specific answers to any of this, but certainly um, diversity certainly looks a lot more like this room, that's for sure. That's, no, that's very, very cool. It does, actually. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. This is not diverse. There are no men. There, there, I would beg to differ that it's not diverse because I see a lot of diversity out here that isn't gen, gender diversity, but there's a lot of diversity in this because room. Half, half, half of the population is not. Understood. Actually, more than half. Understood. Um, but I think that um, certainly that it, th this discussion is actually the point. It's not just gender diversity. It's, there's diversity across the board, and um, I think that there's, there's diversity in, in um, sexual orientation and ethnic background and cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds and all of those things, and they all need to be, to, to be heard. And one of the things that I liked that Sam talked about it, and he, he only said it very briefly, was he said about listening. And one of the things that I learned when I was teaching back in graduate school was when you ask, are there any questions, you wait. And you wait longer than you think it's comfortable to wait. Because there's always that voice that might just speak up when you're really, truly listening. And I think that that's a big part of it. I want to add to what you're saying, Cornelia, because I think it's very interesting how we define diversity. I work for an international company that's based in Paris, and diversity is an American working for the company, so just to, <laughs> I've just learned that, but I'm just, I'm just kidding. But to the point, I think it's having different skill sets. So I think as we start to get more involved in the world of technology, not everybody has to graduate from a school with an engineering or a programming degree, there may be some people with um, a degree in human resources or in the area of um, English that can add capability and a different point of view into what we're trying to do. They may not be the coder, but they can be providing a different point of view so that it gets more interesting with those, those minds. Yeah, the other thing I, I, I would add as well is you know, kind of going to the idea of what can we do about it. Um, one of the things that, that we've done at HP, and we've done this not only um, amongst our, at, you know, via HP, but we've also done it by participating in other organizations that sponsor diversity. We um, launched an, um, a, an open source for women program last fall, and we had such a great response from it. We initially thought maybe well, let's try this as a one-time thing, but the response was overwhelmingly positive. So we are in the process of launching a second version of this. But I think those kinds of things where we can sort of think of ideas and thoughts on what we can do to help bring in the, the diversity, and, and here it's specifically gender diversity that we were focused on. We were sort of, we got our heads together and said, well, let's focus on this yeah. because we noticed it was a problem with an open stack. In particular, that was the one we first noticed. And then we just have been broadening it and trying to expand it. Um, let me ask, I don't know if this one's turned on. Let, let me ask you guys a question. And, and I'm doing this to illustrate a point. Can you put up your hands if you're from the Bay Area? Okay. All right. So maybe about, a th no, leave your hands up, please. So about a third of you. Can you put down your hands if you're under 50? You see my point? There's a lot of different kinds of diversity. So it just is your point, Cornelia, right? You can't stop thinking about it. And here in the valley, I'm in the valley, there's a huge amount of ageism that is not, and that's not as rampant outside the valley. But here and where there are the strong startup communities, it is a huge issue because it does, you know, um, folks with more maturity and more experience bring more maturity and help to elevate some of these discussions and just in general add another dimension of diversity. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. Love it. For me, it's also diversity. If we respect the fact that they have different, you know, important issues in their life at this point. If you're a mother with young kids, you don't want to say, I'm going to be there 14 hour days. And sometimes we have to teach our male managers, that's not what you're looking for. That's not commitment for you. Make sure they can do a good eight to nine hour day of solid work, and then you're happy to have such an employee. I don't think it's just about children. I think it's about different points in your life. I mean, last week I was just diagnosed with thyroid cancer, so I have to take a couple of weeks off. I'm not sick, but people are, are automatically said, oh, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. I have to go through a, a treatment, and then I'm back. So, I mean, it's not just about children. It's about points in time in our life that we have to really deal with and share with people so that they understand that when you're open and honest that the world will understand where you are and you can maintain your power. Well, actually, I want to take that into. <laughs> yeah. To go to a point, Malini, that you said earlier is, you know, how do we do more than pay lip service to diversity? You know, with Intel investing over $300 million and really building out a diverse workforce, how, how do we do more and how do we really turn this into a movement? Um, so first and foremost, you know, you can't have diversity, you can't have at least gender diversity unless you interview them. So one of the things we're doing is anytime we have a job opening, we conscientiously say, where are the women here? Uh, you know, bring them in HR or let's go recruit from different places so we at least consider them because they might not have even heard about the job, their network might be small. That said, another thing is now we're actually consciously looking, has there been some unconscious bias? We're not even saying someone is doing it intentionally, but there are just certain adjectives you might use with respect to a woman. Oh, she's friendly, or she's considerate, or she's kind, or whatever, even if she does 10 times the work, you know, so at least twice the work a male does. And there's also some amount of paranoia, whether you want to accept it or not, like men are concerned, Intel's going to think about women, promote them maybe. Maybe I won't get my promotion. So we're consciously uh, trying to address that, have discussions, and you know, we might, it's just nice that they air it. It might come up at lunch and we talk about it and say, hey, no, look at this. You have women, you are, you're having conversations with me. We work together on a pattern. It just means we're just as intelligent as you and maybe we've been overlooked for promotions. So we're trying to deal with this head on at interviews, at lunch table discussions, ask those questions and make sure people are heard and recognized now. Yeah, if I just say oh. one thing that, something that we learned, Etsy is a company that's really done a good job with bringing in more diversity. Um, their numbers are, I think they went from 8% to 31% in, or actually lower than that, but in over five years, which is impressive. And one of the things they did was they, they made their interview panel more diverse. So in other words, they, made, they brought on women and people from different socioeconomic backgrounds um, onto the interview panel because we all tend to hire people like us. And so the more diverse the interview panel, the more um, opportunity you have. And also for the interviewee, if they're able to identify with somebody on the panel that reminds them of them, they're going to have more interest in joining that company. In IBM, we have basically proactive programs for diversity where we identify top talent people and they are brought, in the case of women, they're brought in, they're given an intense mentoring session with executives and you know, a plans are put together in terms of what are the activities that they need to be doing, what is the mentorship, what are the opportunities uh, to progress their careers. So it's a very proactive, very directed program um, to make sure, and it's particularly targeted at elevating people to the really the more senior levels. And then, of course, we have other programs as well. Uh, at HP, what we've done is uh, we act, I feel fortunate because I'm in a unique situation in the sense that HP has a woman CEO and a woman CFO. So we have Meg Whitman and Kathy Lesjack, which is, for me, it's the first time I've been in a company where there are uh, women in both of those positions. So it's pretty exciting. I think it, it's, it permeates down throughout the organization as well. It, it seems as if every business group that we have and every function we have really focuses on, on diversity. And they look at it more broadly than just gender diversity. But they do have proactive programs in pl place for specific groups and organizations. 
Yeah, and there's no question that it, proactivity, I, I love the fact that everybody's talking about it because it's, it, nothing's going to happen unless we actually make it a point to make something happen. Um, I talk to a lot of people who say, yeah, you know, that is a problem, but I don't get the candidates. Or recently I was chatting with somebody who said, you know, we'd like to have more women speak this conference, but we're just not getting submissions from women. And the answer is, well, are you trying to get submissions from women? Because you do need to, to go out of your way a, a bit. And I think one of the best examples that even came up at the panel at the, uh, the Tribeca um, premiere, uh, one of the, the best examples is Title IX in college athletics, where extraordinarily unpopular by some, in some circles, a great number of circles um, initially when it first started, but there's no question that it has empowered not just young women to come in and do athletics in college, but it's, it's, it's empowered women generally, just because of that change in culture that women can be now seen in competing at the athletic level at, in college, and, and it's even increased the number of women who are competing at the um, professional level. That empowers even young girls to think about, what can I do? That's something that I can do. So proactive. Um, putting putting a, a rules in place in your corporation and, and maybe even broader than that, I think, is a really critical part of the uh, equation. Uh, I have one point. When we write up these, um, you know, descriptions for jobs, don't make it like excellent in A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, because women, if they're not, you know, A in all of them, they might mm -hmm. not even apply. But men typically apply even if they're good in one or two things. So. That's one way of not pushing them away. And then I have one more comment. It's on mentoring, mentoring. I, I hear that everywhere. We really need sponsors. So if you have the opportunity to be a sponsor, please be a sponsor. And sponsor is very different from a mentor who says, you know, it's good if you do this, it's good if you do that. A sponsor says, I know you can do this. I believe in you. And here's this opportunity. Go apply. Or I'm going to push you up for this opportunity. Be that sponsor if you have that opportunity. And then. If you get that and you move up, pay back later. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's OK. It's all right. I just have to steal from everyone so that I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I want to just make a comment about sponsorship. Um, I worked at EMC for 14 years. And when I wanted to change jobs and move to a different company, they sponsored me. So the executives, two of them, one from EMC and one from VMware, the CEO of VMware sponsored me and at one of the executives at EMC to take the job at Capgemini to then manage the relationship back to EMC. Now what they were doing is they were putting their most trusted person in their partner so that we could build the relationship to the next level. So it really is a good example. But now that I'm at Capgemini, I'm saying, what can I do? Corporate headquarters in, is in Paris. Well, the corporate council is the head of diversity at Capgemini. She calls it Women at Cap. And of course, she calls me right away, oh, I hear you're, you're on our team. What can we do together? So the reputation goes with you and stays. And one of the things that I suggested, and I think this is important for all people, it's not just inside your company that you're building women's re reputations. It's who they are outside the company and how they can drive business for the company. So what we have done is we've built two things. One is all of the women outside the company that are customers, we are going to match them with a woman in the company at the VP level or above. It doesn't have to be the most senior so that they are very visible in driving business forward. So that gets that relationship. And it's a different point of view about business. Yeah. And then the second is, and this is something we can all do, look at events and what events and programs where we, can we target women to receive awards in business from a business point of view. So I know we're talking a lot about diversity, but let's talk about this from a business perspective and show how influential and how commanding of the business we can be. So with that, which was an amazing, on its own, I think that's a whole different conversation just on that. <laughs> I would like to open it up to the room so that we can really make this an inclusive conversation for everyone because our, our vision is really continuing this conversation after summit throughout the year. So we have some mics around the room if there's any questions from, from you. Oh, thank Hello. you. Hello. So I, I guess I just have a, a confession to make and I, wanna, I just wanna see if this is okay because I feel a little weird about it. I'm a hiring manager in my company now. I've got <laughs> I'm hiring too. No, but I mean, not for this. It's for it's for building engineers, mechanical engineers, and I'm overtly sexist. 
Like everyone knows that if I have a position, I'm going to kill the woman. I'll steal from another company because I honestly just believe that women make better than women over. Is there anything wrong with that? Like, will I get? Yes, there's something wrong with that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it seems I mean, dangerous. You're, you're, you're opening yourself up for a lawsuit. Right. That, that, right. That's good. You, you are talking about discriminatory hiring. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. But I'm talking about... <laughs> in, 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 you might know. You might. You're being taped. You might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Northwest company and it's not... But yeah, it's... But, I mean, is there a danger? Like, is, is there a danger in... I guess there is. But there's so few women in the industry that I'm... So are you, are you going to hire uh, more, uh, you have two candidates who are equally qualified, are you hiring the, or, no, you have a male who is more qualified by a little bit, are you hiring the man or are you hiring the woman? You know, I mean, I think that's, I would hire the, that's you know, but here's the thing, I think I would hire the woman so, because there's so few of us and I prefer. I just wanted to give another perspective. Again, I was at an event last week where somebody came up to me and, and what his response was, did you interview a woman? Was a woman considered when the company is hiring somebody? So, I mean, there's a different perspective that you can bring so that you don't create any issues for your organization. And the other thing that we're hearing a lot of when we're out there um, interviewing is that women want to be hired because of merit. So women don't want to be hired just to like check the quota box and put up on a shelf somewhere. They want to know that they got the job because they deserve it. So Absolutely, and that's how I got my job. I really yeah. just feel like women in this particular position are better. Well, but I hear what you're saying. Problem. I've got to be careful about it. Yeah, and, and yeah. the reality is that we all have biases. Every yeah. single one of us have biases. Right. And there are techniques that you can use as an organization to deal with those biases. So measuring things is extraordinarily important. It's writing things down. I think even something as simple as a code of conduct mm -hmm. is, it's not that the code of conducts ever say anything that we're surprised about. It's just that somebody's actually making that part of the conversation. Right. But biases are, they exist for all of us. And so measuring things, other techniques that are going to help us hire regardless of that bias. We shouldn't hire because of a bias in, I, in, in, in any particular group, yeah. but we can use tools. And there's even yeah. tools, I recently read an article um, that it, it was something like the top 10 tools that are addressing um, diversity in tech or something like that. And there's a whole host of startups out there that are building cool tools that are allowing you to, for example, source resumes without looking at any oh, that's any gender idea. gender any, any kind idea. of biases based on merit alone there are other startups that are are doing a whole host of different things and i would encourage us of course yeah. i'm a tools person i work for cloud foundry i'm in the engineering group so i'm a tools person and i like to throw tools at everything but there are some tools that we can use that's to eliminate idea. the bias yeah that's a good idea i should take the names off the resume so i don't immediately exactly do what i do where i put put them in different stacks. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yep. and the other thing, and one thing I want to correct is that, you know, there's also a situation of you have an all-male team or an all-female team and you actively want to increase the diversity. I think that that's quite valid, right? Because you're, you're trying to, that's one of the qualifications of what you're trying to do in the team to get to more innovation, et cetera, no matter what, you know, just to expand it. So, yes. hi. I just don't, and this is, I think it's actually one of the struggles that we all have right now, right? Because I don't, one of the struggles that I have in my career is what I see a lot of time happens is that we, instead of creating incl inclusive culture, we're creating another elite club. Like, you know, there's elite women who are extremely smart and technical, and you try to propagate this, and suddenly we kick out this relationship, we'll create even bigger gap, because when I come to work, guys looking at me, did I get my job because I'm a woman, and because you want to increase that? Or did I get the job because, I, because I'm qualified? And it's sometimes women start to work extra hard and extra time and sacrifice more time, and it's just not fair. So it's, it's, the question is about, you know, I was fort fortunate enough to have a great mentors that are men. And they understand, they learn from me, I learn from them. So how do we create this culture where it's not an e exclusive club, but actually men also change and be part of that and whatever else diversity is there, we need to create a men sponsor too. And it's not as a daddy 
figure, but more as a partner figure, right? Who can help and who can sponsor and who can bring people, women, into the powerful positions. I so how do you I, do I, that? I, I agree with what you're saying, because I think you're right. It's, it's absolutely important to have the diversity, and the diversity is not just narrowly focus on, on women, um, but instead it's broadening that out, because I think it, you can learn from having all different kinds of diversity, because then you get different perspectives on issues, and you look at things differently, which I think is in incredibly important. So I agree with you there. Hi. I, I, my, I, th oh. I think part of how you expand that diversity with men is goes back to what you said, which is you de deliver business results. The more that you show that having a diverse team to the men around you, the more, and you want to highlight it. It's, it's, it's highlighting, look what we were able to accomplish, and part of this was having a diverse team. And I would say explicitly at times, and also, by the way, I've had terrific male mentor sponsors. You know, there's a lot of great men out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. There, there, are, there are parts. Of course, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Hi, um, my name is Lucy Mangas. I'm the Director of System Integrators and Alliances at EMC. And I just want to make a couple of comments. I'm originally from Mexico City, and I got moved to the Bay Area when I was 28. I'm not going to say how many years ago, but <laughs> some few years ago. And uh, I was very focused in the telecom industry and in sales in Mexico. So as you can imagine, I was probably the only woman around a lot of sharks around for many years. And when I moved here, I found out that I have to work harder and I have to work really, my voice hurt because I had an accent. I was Latina, I was 28, and everybody, and I'm short, 5'2". <laughs> so, you know, everybody was like looking at me and saying, you know, what does she have to offer, right? So you have to work really harder. And also, through my career, I have to make very tough choices because the moment I have to decide to have kids, it was a matter of priorities. And because you have to work harder, I found that in the Bay Area, it was not okay to say, I have to go and pick up my kids. Um, I was one time in a very high level meeting when just the HP and Compact merger had happened. And I had an eight month old, eight month old baby at home and the VP of marketing turned to me and say, okay, let's sit down and let's plan. And like, oh, but you have to go with your baby, right? Like giving me this look, and this was a woman, like giving this look like, you're not gonna work for me. So it was tough, you know, it, it, is, it is tough. So I always say that in, if you want to attract the right talent, it is a matter of giving them the flexibility they need. And it, it doesn't matter the gender to me, you know? For me, having had teams that are all men and then teams that are all women, for me, the best works the mixed, right? Because to your point, um, you combine IQs, you combine talents, and that's when you bring the team. But you have to know what your team needs and uh, give them that. And flexibility, then you will attract a lot of women. So, make two cents. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Hi there. Um, first of all, I just want to say that this is really awesome. <laughs> it is yeah. really awesome. It really is. I'm so happy to like finally be really having this conversation, so it's really great. Um, so thanks to everybody for putting it together. Uh, my question is really about education. So I, I saw in the trailer and have seen a lot of push towards education of the next generation of you know, up and coming women technologists. But what I wonder is, is that there seems to be a pretty big workforce out there and lots of people who want to change jobs and lots of people who want to learn new things. But what I don't see is a big push to train really smart, capable women, some of whom, like myself, might be in this room who are like somewhat technically capable, but I'm not an engineer, I'm actually de a designer. And I'm learning to become a developer as well. So, so how do we push that our own generation, like how do we support ourselves to become better technologists? So I, I don't have a general answer, but I'm gonna give you a specific opportunity answer, right? So I work with a company called Galvanize, which is a startup ecosystem and community, and they run a program called G School, which is a six month immersive full stack development. You can come from marketing, you can come from design, whatever, you wanna become a junior programmer. The last group that they just graduated in San Francisco, 50% women, lots of diversity of color. They make it as part of their agenda. 
you know? So I think that it's great, it's inspirational in terms of organizations. I wish I could say I see it all over the place, but I'll give you at least that instance and, and maybe a call out to them because they are doing that. And by the way, it is a male-led company, yeah. but who cares, right? It doesn't matter, yeah, they're doesn't doing, matter. like so it is part of their agenda to promote that kind of diversity and to give those opportunities. Uh, I just have a comment. At Intel, we have something called a DOT program. It lasts from three to six months. Uh, you can choose whichever one. So this is kind of the time place where you go for cross-training. Join another group, work with them briefly. Do I like it? Am I good at it? And then you can just move over. So we make that possible at yeah, Intel. I think there, oh, go okay. ahead. No. So there, there are a number of these organizations. <laughs> it's, it's really fabulous. One of the things that we're doing sort of as a, as a call to action from the documentary is we started a website that's in development um, called cheesecoding.org. And um, it's not just for women, but that's what we named it. Um, and it's actually a resource that's going to have all sorts of, and still it does now already, has all sorts of um, information there on where you can go to learn. So whether it's Hacker School, Hackbright Academy, G School. I mean, there are so many organizations out there now, even Khan Academy, you know, online if you want to do it, but if you want to be in a room with other people. So have a look um, at that web source, and then anybody in this room that wants to add to the web page or help, we're gonna have a mentor match, but, but that's such a great question, and there are a lot, luckily, of great organizations that are helping to train people that are mid-career in coding. And one other, it, yeah, one other uh, comment I wanted to make in terms of, um, because you know we're talking, it's Cloud Foundry and open source event, what have you, is one of the, I, I represent HP on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors, and we had a discussion about gender diversity recently at, at the board level, and one of the things that, that we do um, within that community, within that open source community, is we have a lot of meetups. So those are great opportunities for um, coders to get together, and they're usually, they're, I mean, if you go onto the OpenStack.com website, there's tons of stuff out there in terms of various meetups you can go and um, meet other coders. Um, Lisa Marie here, who is, uh, uh, Lisa Marie Downfee just waved. She uh, <laughs> runs this for, for us at HP, and she's in, really engaged, tightly engaged with the community. And she herself um, has recently written a book on OpenStack. So she's really trying to promote some of the gender diversity. It's, it's very personal to her, and she's also just really passionate about this issue. But that's a great way to meet other folks and learn more about a technology and get more engaged. And I just had a comment about this. So you brought up this notion that people here are trying to figure out how to get into technology. Well, I was in Israel recently in a conversation with some very senior people, and they were saying, we have a shortage of people that are going into technology. They're going into different industries that are more interesting, like healthcare. And so that came across, what do we do with people that have degrees in other areas to bring them back into the workforce so that they can also be technologists, so that they could build what is needed for their community so they can stay as impactful as a startup nation. I think that's happening here in the Bay Area and across the U.S. also. So this is something we should take on as, as a group. How do we get more people into technology and drive the w number of women that are involved? I I also think, um, and we were talking about this at lunch a little bit, that... that the lunch I missed? <laughs> <laughs> that there's, there's uh, a continue, you know, so I'll say something controversial. You don't have to be good at math to be good at computer science. I mean, you don't have to be good at math to be an effective coder. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and certainly, you don't have to remember your math from college to be, be effective in something like G School. I was telling the, some of the folks at lunch, I have a 21-year-old working in, in uh, the Blue Mix Garage who graduated from G School. Her undergraduate is in creative writing. There you go. She did six months then of this full stack training, you know, full stack programming. She's doing awesome. She's terrific. Her name's Savannah Worth, you know. <laughs> And, um, and she brings all these soft skills along with it, right? And she told me, she was being interview actually interviewed by, by a newspaper, and she said you know, that she got into it because she thought it was all about math. And then she saw her brother, who's a computer scientist, and he was building these cool websites. You know, he was building real applications. And she's like, oh my god, there's all this cool creativity. I can build stuff. And it completely changed it for her. So I think that, again, it's part of these, you know, messages out to our own peers, like to, you know, people in midlife, et cetera, so. I, I love that story. And the, the one thing that I want to add to this discussion is that, um, f and I'm putting myself on this list as well. I'm, I'm going to hold myself responsible to this. For those of us who can support 
our fellow women who are coming into the field that are, have been fortunate enough to be in the field, we need to go the extra mile. We need to support. We need to go and do those meetups, and we need to participate in those educational programs. And so for all of you who can help somebody bring it to come into the field, help teach them, I'm putting myself on, on, on notice for that as well. And I, I would love to encourage everyone else to do that as well. She's been trying to ask a question. Over yes. There. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was sure. addressing the question here, which is, the, you know, the current workforce. But absolutely, we need to go into the schools. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially because one of the biggest problems with education is the fact that they can't find teachers. These schools might be, um, to quote Jane Margolis, um, you know, technology rich but curriculum poor. They can't find anybody to teach it. The current Teachers that are on tenure are intimidated. They know that the kids know more than they do about this. Um, and if there's somebody who's a really good coder, well, they're going to make a lot more money coding in a startup than they are as a teacher. So, you know, what you can do to help and to go into the community and do that and be a role model then is is enormously beneficial. That's a great point. Something else to tackle the I education have a question system. over here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tomo. Um, I'm at New Relic, formerly at Pivotal, and I'm hiring, of course, hey, like everybody else. <laughs> But I'm not just I'm not just um, putting that out there. So hiring, building teams. You know, all managers want to build their perfect team, and they want everybody to get along and feel very productive, and that they love work and that they'll stay. And so on that topic, you know, if you already have a team that is predominantly a particular culture, and maybe it might be predominantly a culture that is maybe white and male or Western and male and all that. So I just kind of wanted to throw the question out there. If you've had experiences where you, you want to bring in diversity because you think it'll make the team better, and, it, and I mean diversity in all the different ways we talked about, not just for gender, um, but you know, how, how have you thought about that? Like I personally, um, you know, I, I've been involved with Women Who Code, and uh, I run the Women's Java User Group in San Francisco, so I, I do things that are active for women in tech, but for me personally, I try to turn that switch off for my own personal career and just try to think, well, Sometimes some people get into certain sectors first. Maybe white male just got into this sector first and you know, they've been building teams and they're gonna hire people they feel comfortable with and you know, we're trying to break that mold. So when you're thinking about these teams and, and when you've seen teams develop or when you've built your own teams, how have you thought about you know, maintaining the productivity and the happiness that, of the group that you have with trying to change it if, if you had a non-diverse team to begin with? Thanks. You, you, just, you just basically said that the non-diverse team is more productive and happy than they will be with more diversity. No, 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 I was saying that they feel. Like they feel. They're going to be in the interview process, right? Right. So they're going to influence. Right. I, I, sorry. They're right. going to influence. I'm not saying that they were more productive. I'm saying they're going to have an influence. Like, well, I, right. I like this candidate. I, you know, I don't like that candidate. And you kind of have to, well, why? Mm -hmm. Why do you, you know, like this candidate more? Well, he yeah, fits. He's, yeah, you know, I hear he's what you're saying. I, I like this idea about blinding the gender to start yeah. out with, and Absolutely. you know, just just from the get-go. Not just gender, but yeah. anything. anything. And age, right. you're right. Exactly. Gender, where they went to school, age, right? Where, yeah. they, went where they went to school. Is a big one. Where, yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Where you yeah. went to school and really just look at, it, unless know? they're very close out of school. But I think but, it's also yeah. important to have, like, like to the points you guys are raising, to have an open dialogue with your team before you interview. Say, look, I want to put this all on the table. We're going to be looking at this, and I want to make sure we're not going to be biased in certain ways. Recognizing everyone has those natural ones, but if you kind of bring it to the forefront, then I think folks are more likely to um, pay attention to it. So I, I will also say you have to look for subtleties that are happening once you have the diversity, because yeah. I have diversity, right? And I have a lot of, I actually have more women than I do men, as it happens right now. But um, we were tidying up for a visit, right? We're tidying up, and I tell Steve and Savannah, I'm like, guys, go clean up, you know? Okay. And I come back, and Steve is off having a good discussion, and Savannah's cleaning up. And I'm looking at this, I say, and I'm like, Steve, come here and clean up. <laughs> and then I say to Suzanne, Savannah privately, I said, look, it's not that Steve is deliberately saying she's a girl so she gets to clean up, but you're jumping in, you're doing it, you're letting him do this, so of course he's going to let you clean up. Don't let him do it. Just tell him to come help you. you well, it, it's true. I was just in a very large CEO, CXO meeting, and somebody said to me, oh, so where's the water? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. We'll just have to find some, won't we? It was like, why, why are you asking me where the water is? <laughs> We're in I, Vegas. 
I also think it's important, though, to think about, it's not just diversity for the sake of diversity. It's not just a gender issue for the sake of it being a gender issue. It's the idea that when you have diversity on your team, you're going to create better product. And you're going to create product that is going to serve a greater breadth of humanity. And, and that's the importance. You're also going to have more efficiency. And so I think that that's really the end goal. The, when you talk to people, we have someone from, from Etsy who talks about how her male coworkers actually really liked having more women on the team. Suddenly they step it up, suddenly the conversation's a little bit more you know, elevated, everybody's on their game, bringing their A game to the table. So, but I think it's really thinking about you know, what are the possibilities, your team might be doing really well right now as it is and it's efficient, but what are the possibilities of that team if, if you suddenly had diverse perspectives and thought in addition? Another question. So um, we had a comment earlier from that lovely lady talking about the clubs, you know, how you can end up having girls that tend to stick together and it becomes very clicky. I actually want to bring up something that I have not heard. I, um, sorry, I forgot your name, the lady who runs a platform engineering at Cornelia. Pivotal. Hi, Cornelia. Mm. So you had brought up the fact that um, there's a lot of cultural, hidden cultural things as well, different races and religions and this, that and the other. I think bullying is a big thing that people are ignoring and they're hiding behind the gender wars. And, and I've been bullied more by women in tech than by men. I, I, I've had so many different people come up and tell me, oh, you know, you're doing more public speaking now, you should wear a dress, you should wear makeup, or you should, you know, something or another. And the guys actually don't care what I wear. They're going to lech at me no matter what anyway, you know? So, so I mean, let's face it. But, 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 but the thing is, like, what are we doing to foster some of, you know, not judging each other? I mean, mums judge each other all the time. I'm a mother, you know, we all know how mums get with each other. Oh, you work? I don't work. I stay at home. How do we stop the bullying amongst ourselves to also then foster the, the sort of culture we want other women to bring in? Yeah, and, and so I'm going to come back to the comment that I kind of glossed over earlier, which is that I think that I think code of conducts are really interesting. I'm going to slow down a little bit here and say what I tried to say earlier. In that, I mean, I read a code of conduct and I read it and I think, come on, nobody's going to do this. And, and of course, I realize that people do do, do that. It, it's very real and I'm a mom and I'm a working mom, so I've, I've been on the end, other end of that as well. Um, I think, so I think code of conducts, putting it out there so that people read it, um, and, and that it's, by the way, that it's out there at the beginning of a conference and, and the Cloud Foundry Foundation did a great job. The code of conduct was there way before the program was there, even before the call, call for papers. So I think that making it, saying, hey, we are making a stand, gets people to read it, gets people to, it's right there on the menu, it's on the front, front menu. I think, I think that that's part of it. And then I think that Another part of it is that leading by example. Um, I, I don't know what the, 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 I don't know how to have other people do things that they shouldn't be doing, but I know that if I'm less judgmental, if I use, if I think twice before I say something, and again, we all have biases, and if I stop for a moment and I think about my own biases before I respond and think that through, and, and honestly being le less judgmental personally, I think, that, that's one of the ways that we can do it. I, I'm not going to judge the stay-at-home moms because th there's no judgment there. Everybody's making choices. And so taking personal responsibility is, is certainly part of it. Uh, it you know, it, it gets back to what you just said. When you create communities of people that are collaborative, open, and welcoming, and you keep out the bullies from those communities, yeah. you start to see a change in the way people are working together. I know that I've been in, I built EMC's Women's Leadership Forum on the West Coast, and my style and my openness and, and what I was bringing to the table, I brought in people like me at different levels in the organization and gave them equal power that I had. So by doing that, the community leveled out and everyone realized that they could be part of this and they could be a leader and they belonged. And then we spread it out to the external community. So you can change it by creating a culture that is very powerful and welcoming. And that's another way that you can get this to move in a different direction. It's up to us, right? That's, that's great. We have another question. Hi, I am Hen Goldberg. I'm from HP. And I moved to the Bay Area just a year ago. And I'm really honored to be in such a session. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned bef before about uh, talking with the team before interviewing. And what I found really difficult is that 
It's true that we uh, measure business results, but also how we get there is different, right? So yes, I smile more than most of my colleagues, and I will, my, I will probably get the same business results and maybe even better, but we don't uh, appreciate different styles, right? We expect everybody to behave like men. So I know I have some men qualities, but we saw before in the movie we will be missing one million engineer positions. So not all women has to have those men qualities. They can be friendly, and they can, as you said, they don't have to be the best at math. How can we build such a culture that really appreciate different styles, different qualities, especially with women which are, yes, I, I, I'm a better manager once I understood that I need to continue be a, an, and act as a woman instead of trying to be a, a man a manager. Good point. Are we all smiling up here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I think that's a really interesting point and something that we've um, learned from a lot of the psychologists that we've talked to. It's about instilling confidence in our, our young girls. And that's such an important thing. And still so much confidence in our girls, I mean, and boys too, of course, but especially in our girls, that they really can be what they want, whatever they want to be, that they are enough as they are. And then hopefully, you know, it takes, it takes a long time to change a stereotype. But if we're able to do that and bring up our girls with all sorts of confidence, I think that will help. Yes, you can be good at math, and you can be good at English. You can be good at art, and you can be good at science. Yep. And the yeah. other thing that I want to add is, uh, it's not just instilling the confidence in girls and the confidence in boys, but it's also, as, as mothers of the next generation of kids, I only have a son, and my son has a already long-term girlfriend who is a very powerful and confident young woman, and he's had friends of his say, gosh, how can you be with her? And he's like, what do you mean? She's awesome. And so we can, as women, we set an example not just for other young ladies, but we set examples for young men. Absolutely. And that's yeah. hugely important. I, I think. Yeah. Okay. Tap, tap. Um, my question, or rather, I'd like to discuss a little bit more about socioeconomic factors and going back to the confidence level, because I think that. Um, you can shine a spotlight on a girl all you want, but if she has no clue what she can be, if she was raised in a place that didn't have a computer, or parents who don't frankly want her to succeed, it just gets so hardcore on how to change that. So my question is, how would you approach changing that? Or fixing that? Well, there are a lot, a lot of great organizations. One of them is called Black Girls Code. And, um, I think that's starting it. These are girls that it's primarily in Oakland, but now it's national as well. And um, they are bringing young girls that are from societies that typically would be marginalized to tech um, into a space where they're feeling comfortable. They're learning what it's like to hack. And yeah, I mean, they're in a, a sheltered environment to start with, but they're getting their confidence up so that they can go then be it, you know, at a, at a hack somewhere with, with men and women and people of all different colors, or they can be the only woman of color or girl of color in that room and feel more confident. So there are other organizations like that out there, but that's one in particular that I can speak to that I think and, is doing. And actually, white, white girls come from poor families too. Well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's right. Yep. That's just one. And Robin, I'm I've, that's just one example. Robin, I'm counting on you at the State Department to get them, them to add it to mandatory curriculum and. Uh, yeah. in elementary schools. Uh, I, I, just, on it. I just like to point out that right here in the Bay Area, we have uh, YWCAs that support tech girls. So they go to underprivileged schools, have a free service, come on in, here's a maker kit, use it, see what you can do with it. They take them to the maker fair. So there are grassroots efforts right here in town and please join them. And they can always use speakers on the weekends or during the school day and that's one thing. And another thing Intel did is, they have like these corps, like five, five people going somewhere, maybe to Ethiopia, maybe to India. And one of the things we did is we had like a tablet and a phone and helped them like determine how much fertilizer a farmer needs, what crop, when, and stuff like that. And this was an easy way for them to see how they could bring technology to their community, increase their own social status, something that even a woman can do. She doesn't have to be like 200 pounds muscle building anything. And then that comes back to them saying, okay, she can earn a living, she can be important in the society, educating her is important, and then the economic cycle feeds in and that helps the women. Can I make so a, we have a comment as well? Um, one thing that 
we, I think as a, a community we should do too is I, I've encouraged my daughter to help in this area as well. She's only 13, but she is one of those, she was one of those kids who loved math. She was initially somewhat intimidated about, you know, raising her hand and being known as the smart kid, but she loves math. She has a, a great math teacher this year. It's the first time she's had a woman math teacher, so she's thrilled. And one thing she wanted to do, she wanted to go out and help other kids. So she's now been volunteering after school three days a week, um, tutoring low-income kids in math. And that's something where she's very passionate about it, and I feel like she's you know, instilling in the next generation, too, trying to help them. And when I first contacted the folks who run this program that she's part of, they were just thrilled to have a girl who loves math, because they were saying they need more of that. So she's recently enlisted four of her friends to go along with her, so four of her girlfriends. So it's, it's kind of like encouraging that piece as well, I think, is important. It's great. What a great I mean, story. I, I, these are these are great great efforts and everything, but I mean we have a systemic education issue in the United States between the affluent and the not affluent. I mean here here in Silicon Valley, the difference between a school in Northern Sunnyvale or in San Jose versus the facilities in Cupertino or Palo Alto, it's horrific, right? You know, I mean it, it's it's. It, I wish I knew how to fix that. I think you know we have to keep raising our voices more, you know, politically, right? And and going to you know going to uh, Washington and shining a light on it, and you know because it's not just about code, right? I mean it's even it's it's systemic and it's fundamental. Yeah, I will say that we've been into some private schools filming, um, like in Tony areas that don't have any more access to computer science education. In other words, they don't they're not teaching it before junior year of high school for the AP class. Um, so that's kind of a problem across board. It doesn't matter if you're at a private school or a public school. In fact, some of the public schools, thanks to um, code.org and Code for a Day, Day of Code, and some of those organizations are, are having more access to it than some of the private schools. So we have time for two more questions. I know there's been a couple of people waiting. Um, yes. Robin, you um, you started off by saying that we have a marketing problem um, around who a, what a coder looks like and who they are. Um, and the CTO of the country said that um, in the Jobs movie, actually, all seven of the men were cast um, that originally cr participated in creating the Mac were cast in the movie, and the four women were not. Um, so I guess I wonder, like, how do we, how do we? <laughs> Like, we're already having a marketing problem within tech, but then Hollywood gates it even more and leaves out all the women that were actually involved in something. So how, how do we fix that? Yeah, that's interesting. We're actually presenting, um, I'm, I'm doing a speech and then we're showing the film um, at Sony um, to Women in Technology Hollywood on Thursday, and I'm trying to figure out if I have enough time to sort of change it a little bit, this presentation, so that we can really focus on that. Because I think that, um, what are some astounding numbers, and I don't have them, off the top of my head, so I won't give them, but the number of um, hours that, you know, young girls watch television, and the longer they watch television, the um, worse their own perception of their self becomes, because women, girls just, women aren't in leadership roles, and um, they're often, you know, sexualized in horrible ways in the media, so I, th I actually personally think that that Hollywood has a lot to do with this. It's the same way there was too much smoking going on and everybody starts smoking when they were smoking and, and drinking and that stuff like that in films and television, uh, radio and even in our books. But I think that Hollywood has a big role to play and can make a big change if they start putting women in strong positions and strong roles, um, showing them in, in leadership roles in science and anything else. <laughs> Which one? BFF. BFF. Hello? Right. Well, Gina Davis is doing a lot also. We just got back from the Bentonville Film Festival, which is Gina Davis's inaugural film festival, and it was all about championing women and diversity in film. Um, so, I mean, it's a start. Most, a lot, not all, but a lot of the, st of the films were um, documentaries, which unfortunately don't get seen, as, don't get as much exposure. But um, she's talking a lot about it. The Gina Davis Institute for uh, Gender Equality is a really interesting thing to look up if you're interested in that. They, they, um, they're doing what they can to really try to get more women in leadership roles so that we have better role models for our girls. It's not just a tech issue. No, it's awesome. not a tech issue. It, that's not primarily, I mean, it's not only a tech issue. Yeah. Awesome, and our last question. Yeah. Thank you so for this, being so patient. This isn't a question. I, I just wanted to add a little bit um, to our discussion here. Um, you know, we had the issue that you brought up about how women bosses are more, uh, bully people a little more sometimes than um, male bosses. I just wanted to put this thought out to all of you. 
Lots of times what happens is people think, hey, I'm a mother, I know how it is to be a mother. So, you know, you f we kind of feel like we can judge the other person because we know how it is to be a mother, whereas the men think, I don't know how it is, so I'll give this person some more leeway or whatever, right? And, but we have to understand that each of us, our experiences of being a mother are very, very different and we cannot sit in judgment on somebody else's situation. And, and so I think if we were to take that seriously, we would be much more open to you know, being um, flexible with our people. I, mean, I think I just want to leave that there. I love that. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Um, Thank yeah. you. Thank you for letting us wrap up on that. That's a, a great way to, to end yeah. the conversation. Uh, and well, I just want to bring up one quick thing. We should still know. One other quick thing I just want to share with you. We were, we were having the discussion about how, you know, uh, kids in underprivileged areas are not exposed to math and uh, computer science and things like that. I mean, I had a shocking example recently of a kid who goes to a Cupertino school. I mean, these schools are considered the best in math in the country, right? And she was hesitant to go take a Java course. In, I mean, she's in junior high, she's moving to high school. And, she, and the thing is, none of her friends were doing it, and she was like, how can I go do it? I mean, I don't think I want to do it. None of my friends are doing it. They all say there are just too few girls in the class, and that's not worth doing it. And fortunately, there was a code.org, um, you know, local um, thing where they invited girls to come and have, some, you know, to be exposed to various things. She went there. She did some of the design programs that they did and some of the coding that they had. And, and she came back totally convinced that she wanted to do the Java course. So I really encourage all of you to start getting involved in those kinds of things where we expose our kids right in elementary school and middle school to uh, you know, the fun that is there in math and computer science that you know, all of us experience on a daily basis. Thank, Thank you. you, that's awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, ladies. We went a little bit over, and I hope we didn't encroach in other sessions. Um, I do want to end with a couple of points. There is a birds of a feather tomorrow that's been added to the agenda at 2.10 for those that want to continue the conversation. We've opened it up to um, everyone at the conference. So it would be an opportunity to have a, a really great open conversation. Uh, we were also working with the foundation to set up a Google Groups to also continue the conversation throughout the year. And um, there is a little goodie bag for each of you. Um, and that is a USB drive that also includes a trailer of the movie. Um, and we'll also be doing a screening. Pivotal is going to be hosting a screening, as um, are a lot of the other organizations here. And so we'll be letting you know when we have those screenings so you can come see it. Otherwise, thank you, ladies, thank for you. making thank this you. an amazing yeah. event. Yeah.